Welcome to History for the Curious. I'm Mena Reisner, and I host the internationally renowned lecturer, dynamic historian, and tour guide, Rabbi Aubrey Hirsch. Experience our history, confront dilemmas, and reveal the untold stories of 3,000 years of Jewish heritage, from Paris to Cairo, from the Russian Tsar to Maimonides, and from the Sinai Revelation to the French Revolution. Join the fastest growing Jewish history podcast in the world by subscribing to this channel and discovering the events that have shaped us into who we are today. And welcome back to History for the Curious. Welcome back to Difficult Questions of History and Politics. We're going to be joined later in the podcast by a very special guest, Lord David Wolfson Casey. Yes, so this will be providing answers to some of those difficult questions, uh, but obviously needs proper facts, which is why I've resisted all suggestions to be interviewed on TV. They don't have time for in-depth. Having said that, facts alone are not the only makeup of this conflict. There are opinions on both sides, prejudices, and the oldest hatred of all. So, Let's start by stating the accusations of the Palestinians, which are Jews are guilty of colonization, ethnic cleansing, illegal wars and occupation, and apartheid. And when somebody hears that's what the Jews have done, accompanied by the imagery of uh, tanks and planes, well, they think, uh, how else did the Jews end up with the land that they have? And how else did the Palestinians end up as stateless refugees? It must be because European Jews came and settled in Palestine, expelled Arab from villages in, in 1948 and in, in 67 they started a war and they held on to those territories despite the United Nations um, and now they control the lives of millions of Arabs living in the West Bank and Gaza and of course this narrative is readily accepted especially if there's a tinge of anti-Semitism in the air so what I will try and show is that these accusations exist because they conveniently miss out the before and after story. Wasn't it some woman that recently said that context is everything? I think she's from that third-rate university in America. Now, when you're answering a yes or no question, context is the way to duck out. But answering a history question without context is impossible. When you look at a conflict, you cannot just look at maps. You have to look at the players. In the left-hand corner, wearing white and blue, we have a nation that wants one thing, to live in peace. They have impressively built up their country even before it was theirs, drained swamps, eradicated malaria, irrigated the Negev, surrounded by a ring of hostility. They did not have one friendly nation as their neighbours. They persevered against all the odds, and they reached out to every single country that was willing to speak to them. And on the other side, you have a group that was always committed to violence and destruction by any means, whether it was by terror, invasion, war, economic boycott, oil embargoes, and they exported this around the whole world. Hijackings, murders of Jews in Rome, in Paris, in Antwerp, assassinations in Israeli embassies around the world. Now, it's true, being targeted doesn't give Jews rights, but it does give you a picture. You can't look at the last 30 years and just say, those poor Palestinians. They are poor and they are Palestinian. And the question is why? And the answer is almost entirely to do with the actions of the Arab world, especially Israel's immediate Arab neighbours. Historically, by completely denying the possibility of two states for many decades from 1930 onwards, and then deliberately not accepting the refugees, any refugees into their country, um, there are deeper reasons why there are poor Palestinians. Contrast, in South Africa, there was one reason. The whites refused to give power to the blacks, and that was an apartheid regime. They are the ones who enacted the laws against them. It was quite simply black and white. But if today there are poor Palestinians because they voted in an extremist authoritarian organization committed to the destruction of its Jewish neighbor, 
If there are poor Palestinians because Hamas have fueled billions into the building of tunnels, construction of rockets, then, you know, that's a very significant part of the puzzle. So let's get into the details. I mean, a very frequent uh, claim is that uh, surely Palestine belongs to the Palestinian Arabs because they have a historic claim and they have a right to their homeland. Okay. The only people in Palestine who can be described as historically indigenous are the Jews. At no time in the past two and a half thousand years has Palestine existed as an independent nation or country. And therefore, there was never a uniquely Palestinian language, culture, legal system, currency, flag or history. They are historically a non-existent people. Palestinian nationhood is historical fiction created for the first time in the middle of the 20th century. They have no historical claims to a land anywhere, not in the 11th century or 15th or 19th, whereas in contrast, it's been a homeland to Jews for 3,000 years, even when many of those Jews were forcibly exiled 2,000 years ago by a foreign conqueror. And I don't mean that they kept a photo of Jerusalem on the wall. The Jews never became accepted into another nation, nor did they ever establish a nationhood elsewhere. And they enshrined Israel into Judaism for all time, into national, cultural and legal practice. As you are aware, there are differences how you observe halacha if you are in Israel or elsewhere. And all Jews are required to pray for a return to Israel every single day, every Jew, wherever they are. Every marriage is required to incorporate Jerusalem into it. Every Jew has to fast and mourn one day every year over Israel until we return. And we knew we would. That had never been in doubt. Jews always look to move there, to connect. And Jews have a continued uninterrupted physical presence in the land for 2,000 years. So whereas... You know, back in time, there is absolutely no cultural or historic connection by the Palestinians. There is an unbroken connection by the Jewish nation. And as for the the physical land, it was never made into a country called Palestine. It's like Central America. It's not a place. It's owned by various empires. Prior to the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire ruled for 400 years. But the Arabs have been working the land there for, for centuries. It's not something recent. Yes, Arabs lived on the land in the 18th century, 19th century. But even on a local basis, land was owned by the Ottoman state, except generally for religious reasons. Prior, this is to the Ottoman Land Act of 1858. And Palestine was sparsely populated then maybe 400,000 in the entire country, where there are 10 million today. Palestine was also very poorly cultivated. It was widely neglected. Desert lands, uh, malarial marshes. When did it start being called Palestine? Start? Yeah. Well, the Romans called it that in order to remove any Jewish continuity to that piece of geography, but never as a uh, an independent land, ever. Now, In the 20th century, the Ottomans lost control in World War I to the British and French. Normally, newly gained territories would belong to the victor. But the British and French decided to bring in a level of freedom of self-determination through mandate to the region. Some of it because of the help given by the locals during World War I. And this was given to Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and sort of to the Jews through the Balfour Declaration. And then more explicitly to them in San Remo in 1920. Which is why the Arab delegation to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 wrote that the aspirations of Zionism are moderate and proper. In sum... Before 1948, the Arabs in Palestine never owned it, never developed the land, never seriously populated it, were never promised it, never created an even basic level of Palestinian identity or culture there, in contrast to the Jews. And, by the way, the Arabs could have continued that type of existence there. They could have stayed there. Colonialism means to dispossess. Stay on. Farm the land outside Haifa. That was specifically required of the Jews by the Balfour Declaration. No one said otherwise. And it gets even more outrageous because the Palestinians never expressed nationalist aspirations or interest for any homeland there, even the radical leaders like the Mufti. What do you mean? The Arabs never wanted the land? 
Of course they did, but, and this is crucial, they never wanted the land because they wanted a country. That's all post-67. Never before that. It's not because they wanted a place to call home called Palestine. Arab nationalism in the 20s and 30s had nothing to do with the land. Their identity was a religious ideology. Palestine, as we explained in part one of this series, was part of the greater Muslim world. The goal in liberating it was a religious necessity, that the land would be pure. That's why they never called themselves Palestinians back then. In 1936 in Palestine, they led the Arab revolt, not the Palestinian revolt. Their main body in Palestine was called the Higher Arab Committee, not the Higher Palestinian Committee. In fact, Philip Hitty, who is a Lebanese professor in Harvard and Princeton in the 1940s, who gave testimony to the United Nations denying that the Jews had any rights to Palestine, still made it quite clear at the time that for the Arabs there was no such entity as Palestine. And I quote, it was an imposition on the Arabs of an alien way of life. It was historically part of Syria. By smearing the walls of classrooms with maps of Palestine, they associate it with the Jews. Palestine had nothing to do with geography and all to do with religion. And the Arabs in Palestine were led by a radical, Jew-hating, Hitler-loving murderer called Amin al-Hussein, who we've spoken about, who wanted the Jews thrown out. Which also explains something about the 20th century that nobody ever thinks about. Why, when they were offered 70% of Palestine in 1936, remember, a country that they don't own, and they don't see as their national homeland. It's basically a gift from the British. Here, you know, have lots of land which will be yours. Why did they refuse? Because to do otherwise would have given the Jews 30%. No way. And that's why after the 1948 war with Israel, they refused to recognize Israel. They will not allow the Jews rule in a Muslim region. It's a desecration of Islam. And I mean, think about it. Not one Arab entity voted in favor of that Peel partition plan in 1936. So you'd think, you know, 11 years later in 1947, there must be some moderate Arabs by now. Not one. The Arabs unilaterally rejected it again. Every Arab state and every nationalist Arab at the United Nations and afterwards. No two-state solution. And, and this is so clear, in 1948... When the Jews owned only a small part of Palestine, that's the part the Palestinians wanted. They had no aspirations to make the West Bank into Palestinian land. Suddenly, in 1967, when the Jews own more of Palestine, suddenly that too becomes part of historic Palestine. So have the borders of Palestine suddenly moved? No. What changed is that the Jews are there. And if you think I'm exaggerating, look at the change in the PLO Charter from pre-67 in 1964 to post-67 in 1968. Clause 24 in the original 1964 Charter, the PLO waives all rights to these areas. I quote, this organization does not exercise any regional sovereignty over the West Bank in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan or on the Gaza Strip. This clause disappeared from the amended version in 1968. That's why the Palestinians have, or the Arabs, have no problem during Ottoman rule, because even if they weren't free there politically, but the land is run by people who believe in Islam, and that's enough. So let's think about this river to the sea a second. It's all yours. Why? It was never yours. And we Jews never took it from you. We never took it from anybody. So in what way are we colonialists? In fact, we never denied you a state. You denied it twice for yourself. Oh, but I could argue that uh, even though perhaps we never took it from them, the majority of people living in the land were Arabs. Yes. Firstly, they were Arabs from four different countries, not Palestinians necessarily. But more importantly, so what? When it was Ottoman, who were the majority of people living in the country? The Ottomans? Where in the international world is such a claim enforceable? You know, excuse me, there's lots of us here, so the country is ours. It's retarded. But every Jew hater and every UN agency in the country, in, in the world, parrots this. And if that claim is valid, then the country it applies most to is Jordan. Because after 1950, two-thirds of the country with Jordanian nationality were Palestinians. And anyway, Jordan was created out of thin air. It had nothing to do with the Sykes-Picot arrangement in World War I or San Remo or Iraq or the mandate to Lebanon. So give it to the Palestinians. Besides which, this 
entitlement from the river to the sea. Do you know what the second half of that phrase is? Palestine will be free. In Arabic, though, Philistine Arabia or Philistine Islamia. Palestine is Muslim. It's a religious call. Even the third, the, the sort of the relatively tame translation of Tahrar, means it will be freed of non-Muslims. Right. Okay, so you make a strong point that they have no claim to the land, even though there might have been a majority living there. But is Israel responsible for the refugee issue, which is discussed a lot in the news, especially now, ethnic cleansing? I mean, we removed 750,000 Arabs from Palestine. What's the response? Just to start with one point, and that is, previously, I'm not only talking about the fact that they don't have a claim to the land, but that we're not colonialists. That's also very important. But either way, get to the um, refugee issue. So it's true that at least a half a million less Arabs existed in the country after 49, not three quarters of a million, by the way. Uh, but the first and overriding point, had the Arabs accepted the partition resolution either in 36 or in 47, not a single Palestinian would have become a refugee. And that needs to be understood in absolute terms. The Jews never spoke about removing the Arabs from their land. No one would have felt unsafe. No war would have broken out. And 300,000 Arabs would have lived as a large minority in the Jewish state. Refugees exist only because of armed conflict. Conflict which was initiated at every stage by the Arabs. They bear full responsibility and they refused point blank at any stage to talk peace or coexistence with the Jews, uh, definitely until 1977. And let's hear what they said. Don't take my word for it. Jamal Husseini told the United Nations Security Council on April 16th, 1948. This is not May 16th, right? He said... The representatives of the Jewish agency told this forum yesterday that they were not the attackers, that the Arabs had begun the fighting. We did not deny this. We told the whole world that we were going to fight. Azam Pasha, the secretary general of the Arab League, said, It will be a war of annihilation. It will be a momentous massacre in history that will be talked about like the massacres of the Mongols or the Crusades. And this is in late 47. Now, the 48 refugee issue actually splits into two parts. There's creating the refugees uh, by allegedly chasing them out and then refusing to allow them back in afterwards. So let's start with the war, which did not begin in May 48, but in 1947, as soon as the UN vote was declared in November, the killing started. The Arabs carried out bombings and the whole of Palestine basically became a war zone, although the British were still there. But they more or less left the uh, sort of the natives to do what they wanted to each other. There were 126 Jews killed within two weeks. By the end of December, over 350 people had been killed on both sides. With these civilians? It's difficult to define most of the people killed because there were no armies involved in the fight. Some of these people are targeted. Some of them were in no man's land. Some of them were reprisals. And uh, the Arabs' first target was Jerusalem and the old city particularly. By the 1st of January, there was no longer any ability for Jews to get into the old city from the new, because the Arabs understood that if Jerusalem falls, so will the rest. There were 100,000 Jews there, and in Jerusalem, they needed 30 trucks a day to have food and water and fuel. But by March 29th, the Jews were facing absolute starvation. Their total remaining supply was six slices of bread per resident. They had no fresh fruit or vegetables and children were rationed to one egg a week. The United Nations Security Council called for a truce, but the Arabs said no. The Arabs controlled the hills overlooking the road to Jerusalem and they knew they could starve the Jews out of Jerusalem. The Jews asked for a peacekeeping force from the UN, and that equally went nowhere. And at that point, the Jews understood that the only way to keep Jerusalem supplies was by getting control of the hills. People conveniently forget this when discussing this, the current siege in Gaza. Yeah, very similar. We'll get to that next time. So the Jews created commander groups which would attack these overlooking villagers and forcibly evict the Arabs from them, from the, the ambush perch that they had. And that's where Deir Yassin fits in. So the Jews did actually evict Arabs? Yes, in Deir Yassin and other strategic areas, it's called war. You can't have the enemy living there. And there was no way to differentiate between guerrilla fighter, supporter and plain civilian in early '48. Besides, everybody, in fact, was waiting for the Jews to either surrender or be wiped out, especially the British. 
By early 1948, 50 Haganah men and women had been arrested in Jerusalem for carrying weapons and imprisoned. Meanwhile, as uh, Richard Catlina, the head of the Criminal Investigation Department, observed, we didn't mind the Arabs moving around with grenades all over their chests and the cartridge belts, just so long as they didn't bother us. And you have the Royal Navy stopping illegal immigrant ships, which could have held Jewish military age reinforcements and brought them into the country. But the British did nothing about the infiltration of hundreds of armed Arabs into the country. Now, Britain's spokesman at the United Nations denied any knowledge of infiltration. But the Jews knew that the British were lying because the British Army intelligence summaries were stolen and copied every week by the Haganah agents, and it revealed that not only did the British know about Arab infiltration, they knew the date, the location, the approximate numbers in each one, basically because Britain's Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, and his uh, coterie of Arab enthusiasts weren't resigned yet to partitions uh, and to the inevitability of it. But why didn't they just reveal the truth to everyone? The Jews? Yeah. Too long to explain. Uh, Basically, they needed to know when the British were going to evacuate six bases in in Israel, including the Schneller Army Base, for some other time. Anyway, so the Jews were completely isolated. And not being a country yet, they couldn't buy tanks or planes legally anywhere in the world. They couldn't bring them to Israel's borders waiting for the 14th of May. And the chances were very high that the Jewish state would be stillborn. So when the Jews were determined to keep the road open to Jerusalem, it was an all or nothing situation. And Deir Yassin was the last hill overlooking Yerushalayim, overlooking Givachol, actually, because Deir Yassin is Haranoth, the entrance to Haranoth. Oh, wow. Not sure how many listeners know that. I just certainly didn't. So let's talk about Deir Yassin, 9th of April, 1948. It's in every Palestinian children's textbook. I'm not going to go into the whole history. There is a very good video by Natasha Hausdorff, who talks about Dr. Stauber's book on the matter. But there are a few very important points to realize which are well known. Firstly, it was a military operation. The Jews needed the village permanently. This wasn't an attack and a retreat. Secondly, the Jews met with strong resistance. It was a 10-hour battle. It was inexperienced Jewish fighters. Remember, they didn't have an army yet, so no one's being trained. It's pre-IDF. Thirdly, civilians were killed, mainly because it was house-to-house fighting in very narrow confines, where the Arab gunmen were entrenched in the houses of the civilians of the village. Sound familiar? Fourthly, some civilians were killed because they allowed fighters to escape. Some were killed because the soldiers were jittery. Fifth, 60 to 80 percent of the Arabs in that village survived. Even Arab accounts at the time speak of many survivors, which is maybe 20 percent were killed. And finally, exaggerated reports by Arabs to panic the Palestinians into fighting were broadcast as a uh, BBC program shows which has interview clips of the Arabs called 50 Years of Conflict. And you know something? De Yassin did panic the Arabs, not into fighting, into leaving. The stream turned into a river. There'd been 100,000 Palestinians who'd left in the previous three months. 100,000 now left in one month. And then the war broke out. And civilians fled in even greater numbers. There were another quarter of a million in the next three months. Some were forced, some were encouraged, some of their own volition. Now, is it possible that 20 or maybe 30 civilians died who should not have in that one event? Yes. I'm not ignoring that. I'm equally not ignoring the fact that a week later, dozens of Jewish doctors and nurses at Adassa Hospital were killed by Arab militants. And two wrongs don't make a right. I know that. But, for instance, one testimony in Deir Sin by a Jew says, In the village, I killed an armed Arab man and two Arab girls who were 16 or 17 years old who were helping the Arab who was shooting. Is that right? Is that wrong? This is the fog of war. Civilian deaths are triggered by instinctive incidents. You give shelter to a combatant. You are a human shield. I don't know, but I can tell you it is clearly purely reactive. It is not a planned massacre. It is an isolated event in which most of the villagers survived and that there were 100,000 Jews in Jerusalem who were being starved 
and needed this village, that there was no brutality against women, no women and children were lined up and shot, and it was not done to terrorise the locals in Palestine. How do you know that? Well, I mean, beyond the points I've made above, it makes no sense. You wouldn't choose a village which is heavily defended in order to carry out a massacre. You'd pick some random village in the middle of nowhere and you'd wipe everyone out. It makes no sense that you would let so many leave, even escort some of them out. It makes no sense that you would allow reporters and the Red Cross on the scene. But that isn't what any Arab textbooks or history books write. They never talk about anyone being allowed to leave. So the only thing that is said is that the civilians were massacred, not killed, but massacred. And the numbers are always inflated beyond anything which even outsiders like the New York Times or the Red Cross said. And unfortunately, even there are left-wing claims on the Jewish side that claimed a massacre because of Israeli infighting and the followed up by the Altalina, etc., which is a whole area in its own right. But... It's quite clear that Deir Yassin did not precipitate the exit of a quarter of a million Arabs or a half a million Arabs from Palestine. First of all, the ever refugee exodus had been going on for months and civilian deaths on both sides had been going on for months already. It was simply that the Arabs used this as propaganda, as Arabs themselves admitted after the war, for instance, the head of the Palestine Broadcasting Corporation, that they were told to invent tales of atrocities against the Palestinians in order to convince the Arabs that they had to stay. But it had the opposite effect. As I say, watch that clip. There are two things I would add to the House Door YouTube video. Firstly, if you look on Wikipedia, about Day of Sin, the most quoted source is Benny Morris, who was the darling historian of the left in Israel. What's interesting is that about 15 to 20 years ago, he wrote a book saying, I made a mistake. I mean, after all, he wasn't a witness to what took place. He's a historian. And he changed his narrative. That's important. Secondly, Professor Stauber wrote a book recently where he goes through the list of the 107 killed, name by name. Now, he wrote his book in Hebrew. He then goes to Yale and Harvard to get it translated into English. And they said, well, it's a very strong book, but they can't translate it because they're worried about the supporters of their publication house who are pro-Palestinian. Now, I understand that Deir Yassin can be portrayed negatively. It's very easy propaganda. So you need to know the facts, but don't shy away from opening any box about the conflict. It's the wrong attitude. It's very emotive, but the bigger picture facts speak for themselves. Don't shy away if you're well informed oh, after absolutely. listening to the podcast. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Was this the only action that is considered in, by the other side as a massacre or are there other examples? So you talk about the other side. Uh, let's reframe that question. Is this the only action called a massacre? By far not. But if you want to talk about massacres, real ones, not ones that occurred during a war, but against purely unarmed civilians, then let's talk about what was happening to Jews in the Arab world. You don't hear much about them, strangely enough. No one's writing books and making films about them. But over the course of 47 to 48, hundreds of Jews were murdered in pogroms in a number of different Arab countries, and openly so. On the 24th of November 1947, the head of the Egyptian delegation to the United Nations testified to the UN committee, and I quote, the lives of one million Jews in Muslim countries would be jeopardized by the establishment of a Jewish state. If the UN decides to amputate a part of Palestine in order to establish a Jewish state, Jewish blood will necessarily be shed elsewhere in the Arab world. It is to place in certain and serious danger a million Jews. Was that like a threat? It was more than a threat. It was basically a statement of fact. And it happened. Now, there are plenty of so-called massacres, because it's a word the Arabs use with frequency, like in Lida, in Lod, well after May 1948, which actually happened because by then the Jews and the Arabs were full-scale at war. And the civilian casualties were exactly like today. They are due to Arab fighters being embedded amongst non-combatants and shooting at the Israelis. You can't go to war, define it as a total war, and then expect no civilian casualties. I mean, it's the same classic thing. They always start, they always inflict death, and they always blame us, basically because we survived. We're not going to be apologetic about it. It's the same question as, is it fair that there are civilian deaths in Gaza at the moment? Fair? No. It's tragic. 
But who brought the problem into being? As um, Gilad Erdan said at the UN this week, you want a ceasefire? Here's the phone number of the head of Hamas. The war is only because of him. And the stakes, and this is important, in 1948 weren't just high. They were about existence or absolute death for all the Jews in the country. That's pretty extreme for the Jewish nation to be going through two and a half years after the Holocaust. And in fact, 2,000 Holocaust survivors were killed in the 1948 war. You escape the Nazis and Auschwitz, fine, the Arabs will deal with you. So their backs were to the wall. And, you know, spare me the superficial 21st century university lecturers on morality. See the reality for what it was and then you can speak. The lives of 600,000 Jews would be decided over two months of battles. And it wasn't just the lives of the Jews in Israel, but the lives of all the Jews in Arab lands, as we mentioned. Uh, This was literally survival. In comparison, Gaza today is about fatalities. The 48 war was whether a state would ever exist. If they lost, it would all be over. 7th of October, in comparison, is minor. And on paper, the Jews should have lost, except that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. And the Jews knew what was coming their way, if they lost. You've probably never heard about the Times of London headline, Jewish children butchered, because it happened in 1938 in Tveria by Arabs. 21 Jews were murdered, seven men, three women and 11 children in an unprovoked attack on the town. Now, with all this, the interesting thing is that the Palestinians have Nakba Day, which is translated as catastrophe. And for the first time in 2023, the UN thought it would be correct for them to observe it. It's an odd date because it's on the 15th of May, the very day that five Arab countries started a war against the Jews. That's the day they commemorate. In fact, on one of their websites, I came across the reason five armies attacked Israel. It was to stem the tide of refugees streaming from Palestine. That's why they went to war, out of real concern for the plight of their fellow Palestinians. Those very fellow Palestinians that they refused point blank to allow into their own countries afterwards. That's how much they love them. And that's why today, despite their alleged support for the Palestinians, all of the Arab countries combined contribute less than 4% of the UNRWA's multi-hundred million pound budget. And Nakba Day is an odd thing to mark. You'd have thought that Nakba Day would be, a, I don't know, a sobering day of reflection by the Arabs on how misguided they had been to turn down partition and go to war. But no, Nakba is about the blaming the Jews for the woes of the Palestinians, the, you know, the, the ethnic cleansing we unleashed. When did we become the ones who carried out ethnic cleansing? You mean because we won the war that the Arabs started? And to be accused of ethnic cleansing when the opposite has been the case, which is factually provable. Firstly, Whose rhetoric has always been about the complete removal and annihilation, which sounds like ethnic cleansing, the Arabs. The Jews, in contrast, accepted partition and compromise, most obviously in 36 and 47, especially when they were given a fraction of what was the Balfour Declaration in 1917. And secondly, in terms of actions, if the Jews wanted to ethnically cleanse Israel of its Arabs, how come they allowed 160,000 of them to stay in Israel after the 1948 war? Did the Jews expel them? No. Did they put them in refugee camps? No. They remained in Israel and have grown nearly 20-fold to over 2 million, and 68% of them prefer to live in Israel today than any other country in the world because they've got rights to vote and representation in parliament. That's a pretty lousy job for the Jews, who are a people apparently committed to eradicating all the Arabs from Palestine. So basically, back to the original point. The United Nations partition plan did not involve the relocation of one single human being. 800,000 Arabs would have lived in their own Jew-free country, and the rest would have lived in the Jewish state as equal citizens of a democracy. And then 100,000 Jews and 100,000 Arabs would have lived in the Jerusalem area under UN trusteeship. But the Arabs said no and caused a refugee problem. I can give you their phone number if you want to sort out the issue, but don't come to me. But what about the second part of the refugee issue? I mean, you have half a million people displaced. What happens next? In general, what happens to refugees in international law after war is over? I mean, does Israel have an obligation? Okay, so you speak to any Arab and there are two things that they insist that Israel does before any peace talks. Give all Palestinians the right of return and move back to pre-67 borders. 
although I guess some want Jews to move to borders in the middle of the Mediterranean. But the international community always talks about the right of return. Let's talk about it, but comprehensively. Firstly, as mentioned in part two of the series, the very significant addition to the refugee crisis is the half a million Jews who were forced to flee from Arab lands as a result of this war to Israel and who internationally is speaking up for them. Secondly, these Palestinians who demanded right of return, did they recognise the existence of the country Israel that they wanted to return to? Did they acknowledge its rights? Were they committed to uh, a peaceful return and to allowing the government to rule over them? Because somehow I ain't heard a lot about that from them. If all you want is, you know, you want your house back, but you're committed to the downfall of the Jewish state, well, we should take you with open arms. Thirdly, as the foreign minister Sharet in 48 stressed, the tragedy of refugees is not unique to Palestine. There were 60 million refugees in the free world at the time. And there are no historical precedents for the return of large number of fugitives, particularly when you remember the displaced refugees from Muslim lands. As an example, in the early 1920s, there were nearly two million displaced war victims resettled in a population transfer between Turkey and Greece. After World War II, 900,000 Germans are transferred to Germany from Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, as it was at the time. And, by the way, it cuts both ways. The Jews from the old city in Jerusalem and the Etzion block and other areas occupied by Jordan couldn't return to their homes until after the Six-Day War, when their homes were liberated from the Arab occupiers. That's 10 to 20,000 Jews who were displaced. So resettlement happens in almost no cases. But you want to talk? Let's talk. Negotiations, not demands. And based on truth, reality, facts, not rhetoric, and then anything is possible. Uh, but let's also discuss what the Arabs owe the Jews. You started a war. You owe us reparations. Most of the Yishuv's fields were either gutted or mined. The citrus groves, which were the basis of the Yishuv's Jewish community's economy, destroyed. The military expenditure was $500 million. That's in 48 money. And the Arabs then created a financial boycott, which prevented hundreds of companies around the world doing business with the Jews. And 120 companies were blacklisted. Ben-Gurion already said, this is on the 1st of August 1948, when the Arab states are ready to conclude a peace treaty with Israel, and with regards to the responsibility of the Arab governments for their war of aggression, and the long-term interests of the Jewish and Arab population, and the fate of the Jewish communities in the Arab countries, fine, okay, let's talk. And I have to tell you that in 1949, Israel offered to allow families that had been separated during the war to return and to repatriate 100,000 refugees. The Arabs rejected all Israeli compromises because the Arabs were unwilling to take any action that could be construed as recognition of Israel. They made repatriation a precondition for negotiation. And the result was the confinement of these refugees into camps. There was never discussion about Palestinian rights of return because for 30 years after, no Arab leader or country was prepared to accept anything other than the wholesale removal of Israel and all of its Jews. And somehow we're the ones accused of ethnic cleansing. They wouldn't even carry out a mutually beneficial geological survey with Israel. They wouldn't share a glass of water with them. The Jews were the devil. They were anathema. So you don't want to talk to us. You don't want to give us recognition. You don't want peace. Then don't make demands. And I have to tell you that despite the position taken by the Arab states, Israel did release the blocked bank accounts of Arab refugees, totaling more than $10 million. Wow, that's a lot of information to take in, Rabbi Ash. Before we get over to the interview with Lord Wilson, I just want to mention that we still have to cover the 1967 war. We have to cover the siege. We have to cover the West Bank. There's a lot of controversy about it. <laughs> OK, this will all now be next week. Perhaps just a taster. The settlements. They're illegal. Why? Because the Israelis took the West Bank from Jordan. Now, there are four very clear reasons why this argument is untrue. I'm just going to give you one for the moment. The idea that Israel illegally conquered the West Bank in the Six-Day War is based on the assumption that there was a legitimate sovereign state that was evicted, that was thrown out by Israel in 1967, i.e. Jordan. But the land never belonged to them. Jordan started an illegal war in May 1948. Everyone agrees they started. Everyone agrees it wasn't in self-defense. It was a war of aggression. 
Then after 48, they just stayed there. And in 1950, Jordan decided to annex it to their country and change the name to West Bank and the name of their country from Transjordan to Jordan. But this is, was in defiance of the UN Security Council. Jordan's 1950 annexation was recognised only by Great Britain and Pakistan, and it was rejected by the vast majority of the international community, including the Arab states. So it didn't belong to Jordan in international law. At best, it belonged to no one, and therefore the only country with a real claim over the West Bank was Israel, as we shall see next time. Thank you, Robbie Hirsch. What an informative uh, podcast, which I think um, I'm going to be listening to again. It's so important, these podcasts, because uh, we have such a quiet voice in the wider world. And these questions just keep on coming up. And sadly, most of us, including myself, are quite ignorant of the facts and very important to present them so clearly. Thank you, Robbie Hirsch. We are now going to move on to a recorded Zoom with Lord David Wilson. Lord Wilson is a religious Jewish British politician. He's a barrister. He's a life peer who sits in the House of Lords, which makes up part of the UK's parliament for our international listeners. He was born and raised in Liverpool. He spent a year at Yeshivat HaKotel in Yerushalayim and then practiced commercial law in London. He was Minister for Justice for the Conservative government in 2020, and he raised to the peerage in 2021, where he is a strong defender of Jewish values and rights. And he is an openly religious lord, which is, of course, a major kid Shashem. And we are going to go over to that session now. So good afternoon, Lord Wilson. We would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to interview you on matters which are particularly important to the Jews of Britain and Jews internationally. It's an honor to welcome you to our History for the Curious podcast. And we would like to thank our mutual rabbinic colleague for making this shidduch happen. Lord Wilson. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Lord Wilson, as a Jew and a religious Jew who has stood up for Israel and who has a son who's currently serving in the IDF, what have been your experiences from your colleagues in the House of Lords and in your work over the past few months, both in terms of support and the opposite, if that at all happens? Well, thanks again for having me on. And uh, it's a real pleasure and an honour to uh, be with you. So far as politics and the House of Lords is concerned, um, I've got tremendous support. What I think is interesting about the current conflict is that by and large, I think there is a lot of support for Israel amongst the political class, going right up to His Majesty, who's gone out of his way to receive the chief rabbi on a number of occasions and has been very supportive. And also, I think there's a lot of support amongst many ordinary Britons who see the justice of Israel's case, who see the horrors of what Hamas perpetrated on the 7th of October and understand why Israel needs to respond and to defend itself. Where I think there has been a problem is in particular sectors of society, in particular the academy, universities, the commentariat, if we can call them that, In my legal career, I've also received a lot of support from fellow lawyers. I certainly haven't received any adverse comments. What I would say, though, is I think I have found some silence from causes which, in any other issue, I would have expected some noise and some support. Right. Um Can we ask you, you've spoken about uh, the politicians and you've spoken about the universities and perhaps we'll come back to universities in a moment. Um, But at the moment, um, to talk about something which is uniquely perhaps British, and, and that's the BBC. And I don't mean it's current reporting which, um, as you've pointed out in your statement in the House of Lords in October, has been abysmal, but more about the future, meaning they are in receipt of taxpayers' money, yet are, I would say, almost completely unresponsive to complaints. They have ways to obfuscate the reports about internal anti-Semitism, which was commissioned uh, probably a couple of years ago, has still not been released, presumably because of its findings. How can they be regulated going forwards rather than dealing with the present? 
Well, the BBC is often described as a state broadcaster, but of course it isn't. It's not a state broadcaster, it's a national broadcaster. And one of the important features of the BBC, and I'm a supporter of the BBC, I like the fact that we have the BBC. One of the important features of that is that the BBC has to be editorially independent of government. The whole of the Middle East dispute, plural, are presented in a way which is unfavourable to Israel, but which people regard as just sort of obviously true. And that's the concern I have. It, it's really, it's a cultural shift that we need. Now, um, the BBC sometimes says, well, we get complaints from both sides, and that must show that we're doing things about right. I've always thought that's that's just logically false. You may be doing things right, but the fact that you're getting complaints from both sides doesn't prove it, doesn't illustrate it at all. Um, and I don't think also that's the approach that the BBC adopts to other matters of public debate. Uh, OK, but particularly coming back to the complaints procedure and the fact that somebody like uh, Jeremy Bowen, yes, he might not get up in the morning and say, I want to do something um, that will create hostility to Jews or to Israel. Uh, but when he made the mistake that he did on air, his almost blasé response to it um, leaves us with a bitter taste in the mouth. And it's more that the response to complaint is more perhaps an issue to be tackling. Well, I agree with you. I mean, I was one of four lawyers who wrote to Ofcom about the BBC's uh, refusal to call Hamas terrorists. Um, and for those listening to this podcast outside the UK, the UK Ofcom is the uh, communications regulator who ultimately regulates the BBC as well as other uh, uh, media organisations as well. And the reason we went to Ofcom really was because of the point you made. Complaining within the BBC structure was obviously not going to get us anywhere at all. And that's why we took the matter to Ofcom, who are now looking at it. What's interesting about that example is that while it has not resulted in the BBC calling Hamas terrorists full stop, what they now say is Hamas which is deemed a terrorist organisation by United Kingdom law. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful, but it's better than saying militants or fighters or gunmen or something like that. So I think that shows that the BBC can change it, and it will change under pressure. You visited Kibbutz Be'eri recently. What, what would you say this has done to form your opinions on the conflict and how has... How has that changed, if at all? It's one thing to read, and it's another thing to see. I went there a few weeks after the conflict started. In fact, I was in Israel on the Shabbat um, when, uh, when, when the appalling terrorist attacks happened. Uh, I was uh, woken up in the morning. I was in Tel Aviv by an air raid siren. Uh, and I went down to the shelter in, in, in my building uh, and I turned on my phone to see what was going on. My son was called back to base. He was off over Shabbat. Uh, his girlfriend was call called back to her base. And it was obviously something very serious. I then came uh, back to uh, the UK as planned a, a day or two later. Uh, and I went back to Israel. Uh, uh, I think three weeks later, and I went down to Kibbutz Be'eri and Nakhalaz and some other places, the immediate horror of the attacks had been removed. There weren't bodies in the streets anymore. But the place was carnage because after the murders, there was looting. There was burning. Every, every house, and these are small homes had a blast at the back where the safe room was where they'd been blasted open uh there were bullet marks on the walls in some of the houses there were still blood stains on the walls uh zaka who do 
tremendous and holy work were still going round house to house, cleaning up, if I may use that word, bits of tissue, human tissue. Um, each house was marked by the units who had checked that there were no more terrorists there, and then by Zaka to say that they'd been through the houses. Um, there were scenes which were really indescribable. Um, in one safe room, um, you could see where where the bullets had hit. And you realise that the people in those safe rooms were just sitting targets. I mean, th there, were, there was no way they 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 could have survived. Um, when we were there, there were still rockets coming over. We had to um, get on the floor when rockets came over because you're so close, obviously, to the border that the shelters which are around, you literally get a few seconds. Um, so going there, as I say, it's one thing to read and it's another thing to see. But amidst all that horror, there were really, there were signs of incredible optimism in life as well. There's a, uh, th there were a few shacks when I first went to it at um, Shuba Junction, which is just by the border, where local residents had set up a shop for supplies for soldiers, socks, batteries, toothpaste, toothbrush, uh, vests. But this was a shock without money. Soldiers could just come and take. And also food, coffee, hot meals. And the they were ramping it up as we were there. Um, they were sending in, on, for example, a Friday night, 850 hot meals for, for soldiers into Gaza as well as feeding hundreds and hundreds of soldiers there. Um, food was coming in as we were there from everybody. When you talk about Israel being united, that was a sign of Israel being united. A, a, somebody would get out of a car and say, here's a salad I've made. And it would be, you'd look at them and, you know, completely irreligious. The next car would then open the door three Haredin would get out and say, here's some roast potatoes we've made. I mean, incredible. The, the lunch we had there was made by Chabad in Savion. And those who know the geography of Israel will know that Savion is a fair way away from Shuva. So amidst all the horror, that is the sign of optimism. That was a country coming together. I mean, it's... It's one of those days that for as long as I live, I will not forget. Um, to say I was pleased that I went would be the wrong word. It was a, there were some terrible, terrible sights. But I think I had to go, and I know I made the right decision in going. So to get back to the UK for a moment, um, we mentioned it before, regarding the state of education, particularly at university level, which is very worrying currently, what constructive suggestions could you offer to the heads of these institutions and to Parliament to try and sort the issue that we're currently facing? Well, we have to remember that we live in the UK in a free democratic country, and that means people have freedom of speech. That's really important. The question always is, well, how far can you go? Now, for some things, the law tells you how far you can go. So, for example, because Hamas is a terrorist organization, advocating support for Hamas is illegal. Then there's the question of on campus. And my request to university heads is simple. Just treat anti-Jewish speech in the same way that you would treat speech against any other ethnic minority. Jews don't have to be special. They don't need better treatment, but don't give us worse treatment than you give other minority groups. What's been interesting to me, words also can terrify people. And there is a certain violence in words. 
What I object to, though, is when on some campuses words are used which are clearly intended violently and words are used against Jews which are clearly intended to other them, i.e. treat them differently, there is no or insufficient response from the university authorities. Why is that? Sometimes I think people just don't understand, and I think we have to accept that while we live these issues 24-7, for many others, there is real ignorance about them, um, an ignorance born out of genuinely not understanding. It, it's not malicious ignorance, it's just lack of understanding. Uh, sometimes I think there is a fear, though, that if they university authorities take a tough stance on these issues, they will be faced by demonstrations or uh, um, uh, other reactions from elements of the student body. To which I say, well, it's your job as administrators to deal with that. Don't treat Jews differently. David Baddiel had had it right in his book when he said Jews don't count. His his main thesis in that book is to say there can be a blind spot when it comes to Jews and racism. And I think he's right about it. Um, I think in many for many university academics, sometimes they see racism in terms of power and oppression. And the Jewish community, which is generally, generally a middle-class community, generally a fairly prosperous community, generally a community with some involvement in society, it's hard for them to see how that community can be the victim of racism. And I think that's often what lies at the heart of this. Thank you very much. Finally, um, an official in the security world in Israel uh, said to me uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that he feels that London going forward is more of a dangerous spot than Paris um, as a result or as has been shown through the, the, the current state of affairs. What would be your comment on this? Well... I mean, I wear many hats, but I, I don't wear a security hat, so I'm not really sure I'm qualified to comment. Um, I mean, I, I personally think that London is a safe place. Um, we, of course, see a number of incidents, um, but they're remarkable because they are few. Um, my concern with with London really is not so much what's happened in the last few weeks. My concern is that we've got used to a situation where every shul has to have security, where every charity dinner I go to, the event is only, the uh, location is only provided a week or so in advance, uh, where Jewish schools don't have glass in their windows, but have strong plastic where our children are taught the school has two alarms. There's an evacuation fire alarm when there's a fire, and there's an evacuation alarm when there's a person outside with a gun who starts shooting. That's not new in the past few weeks. So that when I think about London security for the Jewish community, that's really what I worry about. However, the CST, the uh, Community Security Trust, is phenomenal. We have tremendous support from the government who give millions and millions of pounds a year to fund and protect the Jewish community. Indeed, I think another four million pounds was given uh, only recently. Uh, and we do have the support of the vast, vast majority of Londoners and people around the country. Uh, I'm not qualified to say whether that's better or worse uh, than Paris in terms of security. Um, I suppose my ideal um, uh, diaspora Jewish community uh, might be to have the uh, vibrancy of debate that we have in London. I really like that. To have the uh, breadth of Jewish community that you see in New York uh, and to have the quality of kosher restaurants 
that you get in Paris. That might be a, the ideal Jewish community. Al, Al certainly moved there. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Lord Wilson. Um, and uh, we hope this Hanukkah will truly provide light, uh, not just uh, within our houses, but uh, across the world, and that uh, peace follows rapidly in the footsteps of Hanukkah itself. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the, the most famous question on Hanukkah, isn't it, is why we light the candles for eight days. When the oil was there, it was going to last for a day. So the miracle was really that it lasted the extra seven. And there were lots and lots of answers to that question. I mean, probably the most, one of the most famous questions in, in, in Jewish law and history. This year of all years, I would like to suggest this answer, that at those very, very dark times, when they went into the temple, when they thought that everything had been destroyed, and they thought essentially that Jewish sovereignty had come to an end. They found some oil. The miracle wasn't that they found it. The miracle was that they lit it. And they said, we're not giving up. They lit it that first night. There were two, there, therefore I think there were two miracles. For the seven nights, the next seven nights, the miracle is that the oil lasted. The miracle on that first night is that at the most difficult times, people didn't give in, they carried on. And when we're celebrating Hanukkah at difficult times now, that's a message I take. We light, we see the light, we carry on. Beautiful. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you. you for having me.